welcome back, everyone. Uh, hopefully, Louise is coming on. Uh, or am I solo? Uh, no, not solo. Excellent. There we go. And we need Mary as well. So we have to we, we have to give a, a, a massive thanks to it, it says technical help. Uh, let's let's see technical guru wizard in the back office uh, with it, who all these wonderful smooth. Uh, uh, transitions would not happen at all. I have said the number of conferences I've been at, and it goes 25 minutes behind. We've been running one minute behind. I can, I, I would never have believed it. So, Mary, you've been fantastic. Thank you very much for your help. It's just been amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's okay. Thanks a lot. Rest. <laughs> yeah, that will be. Thanks a lot. Continue well. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a lovely evening. Okay. Thank you so much for Mary and her help. I'm going to remove the spotlight from her there. So next up, we've got um, a great session, which is sort of uh, drawing us towards the other end. So we're going to um, start to think now about um, the sort of bigger question about if it were to happen again, um, what would a good response look like? So at the table, we've got Sanjoy, Sean, Dan is back again, and um, Ian is going to be guiding us through the conversation, uh, keeping us to time. And then after that, we've just got a couple of things and we're nearing the end of the um, session as a whole. So um, welcome everybody back to the table if you've been here before. Um, welcome for the first time if you're here for the first time. And Ian, over to you. Thank you very much, Louise. So uh, at least uh, hopefully people have seen Dan before on at least their session. Uh, Sean has re-emerged having uh, gone for a, a well-earned rest in between the Japanese and European time zones. And welcome to Sanjoy, who's joining us for this in session. Um, we're going to touch on many of the things that have been said throughout the course of the day. I did just notice in the ethics conversation, I, made some, I was making some notes, uh, the conversation is going to continue. They were discussing trust. Uh, and I think this is you know my notes to introduce this session. Say so we discussed two themes in our preparatory discussions, transparency and trust. So hopefully there's some semblance of continuity going through uh, our thoughts here. So what I would like to do is uh, I'll, I'll start by posing the questions, you know, how do we get to a position of transparency at multiple levels, data and organizationally? And just to give Sanjoy an opportunity to introduce himself, I'd like to go to Sanjoy first. Perhaps you could say a few words about yourself and then uh, lead us into the discussion on how, how do we get the, the data and the organizations to a position of transparency? So Sandra, please. Sure, thank you. Can you hear me, everybody? Uh, could you give me a heads up? Okay, so uh, my name is Sandra Mukhopadhyay. Um, I work at uh, Remote Sensing Laboratory at um, uh, in Maryland at Andrews Air Force Base. I work for the National Nuclear Security Administration. That's the part of US Department of Energy. Um, uh, my involvement with uh, Fukushima was I was um, feverishly downloading speedy data, the um, uh, you know those projection data, and sort of trying to put it on our own database in in terms of mapping. Um, I have some experience with um, uh, radiation monitoring database. Um, I sort of understand what's going on with that. Um, European Command uh, UDIP, UDIP system, the European Radiological um, Data Exchange Platform. And I worked on the International Radiation Monitoring Information System that's called ERMIS, that's maintained by IAEA. Um, so I'm very happy that I got a chance to join this uh, esteemed uh, uh, colleagues um, to talk about very important things. Uh, 10 years, uh, it has been 10 years, but uh, the repercussions are still understood. I was there in 2017 in Fukushima and there were, uh, you could measure three, up to 300 microsieverts per hour uh, in the um, water duct, you know, the things that are covered with cement and all, but there are a uh, cluster of uh, leaves and things still there and they are still hot, 300 microsieverts per hour. Um, so with that, I'll um, stop for now. Thank you very much, Sandra. So uh, I, I know Sean is burning to, 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 to lead us off in this one. So uh, Sean, I'm not, maybe you can give yourself a quick reintroduction, although hopefully most people know you, and then just uh, 
I, I'll let you off the leash and tie you into how we get to this position of transparency. So Sean, please. Yes, uh, so I'm Sean Bonner. I'm one of the co-founders of SafeCast um, and was around in the you know, very early minutes of all of this 10 years ago when we were frantically calling around and seeing who had information and, and what we could do, you know, trying to go forward if there was any way we could help. Um, you know, some would argue this was always what we hoped for, but I think that, you know, if we're honest, we never really knew that it was gonna go, you know, as, as far as it did and, and all of this and, you know, We've accomplished a lot, but I think there's still still a lot more to do. And this is this is the perfect topic to sort of wrap up, you know, this this incredible event so far. And I think that you know, we'll, we'll talk more about this. But you know, our point and my point and all of this, you know, from the beginning, and and still the drum that we have to keep banging is is there has to be more transparency. There has to be more openness. That's what trust in all of this comes from. And without it. You know, it doesn't matter what anybody is saying because nobody believes it. You know, and especially if the if the people are losing trust in the information that's being provided, um, then it's a complete disaster. You know, and uh, the only way that 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 trust is built and the community can understand what's going on is with with that open sharing of information from the very beginning. Dan, Dan, I, I, so obviously we've been talking before, but I, I remember you were giving me an interesting story about the, you know, this tran in the, in transparency. It's not just the transparency, you know, from say officialdom to to the public, but it's even compart. You know, the, there's the culture of the it's compartmentalized uh, internally. Uh, you you were telling us a story about uh, how you know the path that you had to use. I think you mentioned it at the beginning as well today on publishing the data. Do you, do you want? Maybe it's worth uh, revisiting that, if you wouldn't mind. Hmm, sure. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So when we were, uh, you know, as Sanjay said, we were downloading data from Japanese sources, but we were also collecting data, uh, and we were working closely with the Japanese government, and we weren't sure, you know, who owned the data, with whom could we share it. So we. Um, I think in hindsight, and we'll talk more about this, but at the time we erred on the side of not sharing as, as widely, even at home and you know, within the federal government as maybe we would, as we would definitely do nowadays. And you know, that had, had repercussions. People you know, wanted transparency, they wanted to see it and they didn't know why we couldn't share. Um, but then you know, once we you know, thought about it, um, for example, I took all the data, the, I mean, the, the reason that we have the data on the SafeCast uh, website as a layer was we took all of our raw collected data and posted it publicly on the US official website called data.gov, where people could analyze it to their heart's content and do whatever comparisons they wanted. But we did learn the hard way that, you know, if you don't share and you talked about trust, it's, it's very hard to gain trust and we'll probably talk about this more, but it's really easy to lose trust. And then once you lose it, it's extra hard to, to get it back. So I think we have a good opportunity here. There's certainly a lot of trust in, you know, SafeCast and I think we're building trust in citizen, you know, science. So we have to figure out how to keep that momentum going and uh, make it more just part of steady state life. So if I can add you know, just, oh, yep, please. <laughs> um, you know, like in, in this conversation so far, like, you know, over the last few hours, there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, what government agencies and, and these, you know, sort of institutional, uh, you know, people should be doing and everything. But I think that an important piece of this discussion of transparency is, is all parties involved, right? And, and I think that uh, there's just as much sort of constructive criticism that can be applied to, you know, uh, activist groups and, and everything in this as well, who uh, selectively publish data, right? In 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 uh, in the guise of of being transparent, right? And and this is this is as much of a problem as not publishing anything, right? If you only publish data that supports the story you're trying to tell, um, that also doesn't build trust, and that also you know makes everything else you do questionable, right? So it, it really is about, um, as Dan said, being able to compare these different data sources, right? Publish good stuff, bad stuff, things that confirms your stuff, things that contradicts your stuff, and put it all together so that uh, the public can look at this and understand what's happening in the bigger picture. And this is where the sort of building blocks of trust come from. 
I mean, the, the, the thought occurs to me, you know, it's this, it's this sort of people have their own, you know, my opinions are facts, your facts are opinions, and, you know, I'm just going to believe what I want to believe. I'm not going to go into the realm of politics, but I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Um, I just want to bring it back to the question. So if, 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 if you know, something were to happen again tomorrow, what, what would the good, what, what would, a, you know, what's our, our good plan, you know, or, or the document we give to the, the government respond where the, it's happening and say, this is what a good response will look like. Will you do it? What, what, what would we be asking for? What would we be holding them against and wanting to see them do? Is that for me? That's all of you. That's for, well, <laughs> that's for everyone. Whoever wants to go first. Go on, Sean. <laughs> sure. I mean, I think I think that what we would say is we want to know what's going on, right? I mean, I think that that everything kind of boils back down to that. Uh, the problems that we've seen or that we saw 10 years ago and that we've unfortunately seen again and again and again since then, even even as recently with, you know, the COVID response around the world, right, is uh, government sort of defaulting to secrecy on things, right? And, uh, you know, just telling people, just trust us, don't worry, we're taking care of it, everything's under control, uh, without providing any information on that. And so I think that, uh, you know, the most important thing that we can just repeat again and again and again is that the information has to be shared. The plans have to be shared. People have to understand, you know, what they should be expecting to happen, uh, what's happening at the moment, because even if the news, you know, is bad, that at least gives people a context of, of what they should be doing or what they should be thinking as next steps. You know, if, if there's nothing but this kind of rosy story of everything's fine, don't worry about it. We got it under control. Mm -hmm. When people know it's not, right? That, that just adds stress and confusion. Yeah, this is Dan. So definitely from sharing everything from the beginning and writing your plan so things are shared. I've visited different countries and and some have their you know real time radiation monitors around power plants live on the internet, and some don't because they think if it's live, people will be able to misuse it, but I think the opposite is true. If it's not live, then it just leads to, you know, fear and, and things like that. So planning for how you would share and everything from procedures to how do you connect all the systems? And Sanjay could talk about that forever because one of his big tasks was how do you take information from disparate countries and make them show up in one place and all look seamless together. Yes, uh, yes, please, Sanjoy. Yeah, I, I picked up a, a common theme between what Sean and, and Dan said, and that's the uh, this um, uh, whatever we are presenting should support during the accident or pre-accident situation should support the plan. So, so the plan of action. So to tie these two together, it makes sense to have some the data on a common platform in in terms of the what we are looking at. So uh, when I was working at, uh, for ERMIS, the International Radiation Monitoring Information System, um, um, we uh, used to claim, and it is true, that these data are born um, harmonized, meaning they're all, all already, the dose rates are already presented in terms of the operational intervention levels of the oils. So having that, common understanding that whenever you see red on the map, that is thousand uh, micro sievert per above or uh, thousand micro sieverts per hour, then you need to evacuate. So that also ties that, that data makes sense that it is like Dan previously, the other day mentioned actionable intelligence. What do I do? Data in itself, presented on a map doesn't tell us much, but unless we guide people that these, um, uh, at this stage, you have to take some action. We do that routinely also in the US EPA, we have the um, Environmental Protection Agency guidance. And that tells us at this um, stage, you, have, you can do relocation. At this stage, you can do sheltering. So the presenting data in that format makes it very apparent. So things jumps at you. Um, that one thing I wanted to bring up. The other thing I wanted to, uh, in terms of gaining trust, 
um, we don't talk this uh, much about, but in, in this common uh, citizen generated data, there has to be some sense of a column of validated data and a column of non-validated data so that people gain uh, more confidence from the validated data. And then there's a lot to be done um, by, uh, you know, that a lot of work will go behind validation. And the other hey, thing- so can, I, can, I, can I jump in there exactly at that point? So who, you know, who watches the watchers? Yeah. <laughs> so we, we, we've, we've just introduced the concept of a, validate, of a validation field uh, in, the, in the presentation of a transparency of data. So who gets to say valid or invalid? What, what was the answer to that, Sandra? Ah, yeah. So, I mean, in my mind, I mean, and it's open to discussion that uh, if you generate the data, you, you should be able to validate it. I mean, if not validate, at least uh, caveat it. Like, you know, these data were taken at 30 meter uh, or 10 meters above ground. Uh, from fire stations or something. This was automated system. These are the things that was measured. Um, so I, I think it's the uh, validation depends on the generator. Otherwise it becomes an untractable uh, problem. And also if, if you're validating, it has to be against some, you know, well-documented guidance is, if, if you have, let's say one group, let's say you have some official organization trying to validate some citizen science data and they say, oh, a lot of it's invalid. And then you probably have the people who collected it are saying, oh, they're just trying to hide our data and sweep things under the rug. But if we all agree upon, here's some criteria for validation. Mm -hmm. and, and we've done this on the official side. I know, I mean, SafeCast has, you know, some, some guidance on uh, what, do, what data, are valid. There's obvious things that might make you want to throw out data. If, you know, the GPS is wrong. It shows up in the middle of the ocean. So there's simple things and there's a little more complex things, but as long as it's you're talking about transparency, as your validation steps are transparent, then, you know, any trained person can apply them. Yeah, I think Dan, Dan makes an excellent point. You know, we try to publish what are, what are, what we think are best practices, what criteria are we using to say whether something is is trustworthy or legitimate or, or invalid for some reason. If it has a flag on it, that's a concern, but we still publish everything, right? So we say, here's, here's everything. And here's the chunk that, you know, we have a question about one way or the other. And then here's the criteria of why we have a question about that. We're not doing that behind closed doors and then just telling people after the fact, oh, okay, here's the final stuff. Because again, you know, hiding that bit of the discussion opens the door for, you know, all kinds of conspiracy about what's happening behind that door, right? So we're, right. we're just, you know, we're, we're moving through time. I do want, we, we had a second thought in our, in our conversations, which was, you know, how to build the trust in the data and the organization. And it was the concept in the discussions was that the data needs to be actionable. And we mentioned it at some point in time saying, uh, if the data, if you can't do anything with the data, basically what's the point of it? So, uh, what I'd like to ask is, well, what, what do we do with, you know, we've discussed this all day, the entire process, collecting the data, it's got quality assurance with it, it's, collect, it's, it's handled, it's transparent. You know, what, what is it that this, this, this golden package of uh, an actionable data item, what, you know, how, do we, how does it get there does it, in, well in the hands of a decision maker? So, I mean, besides the, the, the management of it and, and how do you visualize it, one thing that I've noticed in the radiological field is that people, you know, don't necessarily understand what they're looking at. Um, even if we do, as Sanjoy said, let's make, you know, red is always the same thing. But if somehow, if, and I, I think this is not in the, the physicist side, but in some, some other specialties, but how do you present it in a way so it's no different from other technical information that people are familiar with? I mean, a lot of people have talked at, talked about looking at, you know, hurricane path plots. Um, I mean, those people look at all the time and they don't actually understand them, but, um, or weather maps. If you can make it so that radiation isn't this arcane thing that's treated and displayed separately from everything else. I mean, it's a hazard and people have to take protective actions. 
So it's the, the human interface. If we could work on that, I think it can become more actionable. I, I've, I've never heard that point on the weather map before. I'll have to think about that. That's, that, that's, that, that intrigues me, that one. Sean, you, you, you look like you're there. So oh, I just, I mean, I, I agree with that, right? And and I think that that one of the one of the issues is um, there's there's a little bit of a you know a sort of default position of trying to do everything, which kind of creates some of these conflicts sometimes. And I think that uh, you know maybe what we what we need to do is you know encourage these kind of different. Um, you know, sort of practices with different groups and different organizations and things, you know, like not everyone has to collect, publish, analyze, and, you know, everything, everything all together, right? Like maybe there is a value in, in distinguishing here's collection, here's analysis, here's commentary, you know, like different, different things so that those pieces, again, are open. People can look at them and understand what's happening and not think that, um, you know, someone's sort of trying to do the thinking for them in some cases. It's like the weatherman on the nightly news doesn't run the weather models. Right. <laughs> yeah. As speaking of weather models, I mean, you know, these days the saying goes, like your database is only as good as the metadata it contains. So it does, I mean, yeah, depth is to do that, to have the, you know, little bit of weather data incorporated on the back layer of the radiation monitoring data. I mean, then you can, uh, you know, and that goes a long way in educating um, citizen in terms of common traits of uh, environmental radiation. Um, like you can show the radon was measured high when there was a rainfall. And you know, looking over a large uh, area region of regions in Europe, um, we could actually follow the weather moving in um, by uh, uh, correlated gamma elevation of gamma to straight. So um, I think incorporating a layer of uh, weather data. Now a lot of discussion has to go on in you know what averaging has to take place and how often you will freshen the weather data um, may explain the data better and gain trust in return uh, on the on your database that's just my thoughts but no it's good it's very good so i'm, I'm going to sneak some, something in from left field because it's occurred to me during this so because, and it and it occurred to me in the map you know we've got dark spots in the map so I don't, I don't think we can, you know, we kind of know what we want. We want transparency. But let's, let, let's rephrase the question slightly. What if it were to happen in a place where it, it was dark on our map, so Safecast want to help a new group from something bad happens, uh, what would be the kind of, uh, you know, rapid advice to the, the Sean, Asby, Peter of, te, you know, and Dan 10 years ago, and you can pick up the phone and say to them, right, Here's a quick brain dump of everything that we did wrong and that you could do better than we did. I, I welcome, I welcome that. <laughs> somebody, somebody tell me. <laughs> we're still trying to figure it out, right? I mean, I think that that's a huge piece, right? Is that we're still learning as we go, right? I mean, I think every every bit of this, we're fine-tuning and revising and and trying to take a better step tomorrow than we took yesterday, right? You know, one thing we don't consider in emergency response is the human ingenuity. I mean, uh, a lot of criticism were made that um, when the power was down and, um, you know, they had to um, bring the coolant up somehow, people tried to run out to the parking lot and tried to get the car batteries to power, uh, generate power to get the coolant going again. So that will stand, that's, that's humanity. And that's going to always be with us. And uh, in, in this park of the moment, the best thing you can hope for is that somebody make a, you know, I mean, you cannot depend on it, but that kind of force in action will take place. Um, and I hope that, you know, the next time it happens, I mean, we will be definitely more uh, ready uh, and as I mentioned before, 
I think there will be huge application of drones and robotics so that um, you don't directly involve people in the process and expose them. Dan, as it, as it happens, I, I gave you the first word at the beginning. I'm going to give you the last word at the end. So if, if it happened again tomorrow, what's the good, what, what's the, so the good if, advice? Yeah, if you say, what would we have done differently 10 years ago that we should do? Yeah. Um, I think if you go into it, knowing that you're going to share data and share it quickly, then you'd have systems and procedures in place so that you know you're collecting it and validating it and you know, while you're analyzing it and trying to think of all the complex protective action decisions, you know, your validated data is already being shared and, and posted. Um, so, you know, when we were sharing data and thinking about it after the fact, there are some things that, you know, if we'd done ahead of time, we could have done it faster, like who do we consider the official owner of the data? If it was our data or Japanese data or US military data, if we go in knowing that, you know, it was when you, Get the data from someone you ask the question up front can we share it yes or no and that actually becomes you know a, a data field shareable yes no just like validated yes no so that's one thing i would do at least on the, the transparency sharing side i would do differently yeah i think one one thing that, we, that we've learned you know a lot in the last 10 years is that it's much easier for all of these steps to happen if it starts open you can start open and then close something along the way but it's it's very difficult to open things up if they start off closed. Uh, I'm going to let be the end of that session. Thank you very much, uh, all three of you, for for, for doing that. I, it's been, you know, we think about it all the time, but it's it's lovely to have a, a conversation. And uh, I think it just brings the threads of lots of discussions together uh, that have happened throughout the day, thinking about the data. But at the end of at the end of it, the point is. Uh, the organization thinks about uh, the transparency of data. And as Sean rightly said there, start from the premise of trying to share what you can rather than deciding to start close and share it afterwards, you get a different outcome.